Good afternoon. I'm Liz Kruger, State Senator for the 28th District. And for those of you viewing on Zoom or Facebook, or those of you calling in, you are today listening to the, and watching, the third day of my 14th annual Senior Resource Fair. This year, we're doing it virtually over three days, instead of having up to 900 people on one um, floor of the basement of the Temple Emanuel Synagogue, who so generously participated with us for 13 years. And I bet they'll welcome us back next year when hopefully we'll all be ready to do large group gatherings again, because we will all have been vaccinated and we'll put this period of our lives out of our memories. But there are great ways for us to communicate, learn new things and do new things and that's what we're trying to help everybody do now that we are virtual and we have a really terrific final day for you. But before we get to that, a few basic reminders. Um, one, we have something called CART, Communication Access Real-Time Translation, where a captioner is converting everything said to text. And as a viewer, you have an activate closed captioning option to view text on your de device. So if you're using Zoom, click on the closed caption CC in meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you will see a setting on the bottom right hand corner of the video, click closed caption CC to start viewing in closed caption. Um, this has been an enormous value to people who have um, limited, limited hearing, which is a huge percentage of the public, especially as we start to age. I also want to share some information about voting because I am just a broken record. Finished last night in a voting rights um, discussion and rolling right back into it today. Um, this is the most important election of my life, I think perhaps all of our lives. You need to have a plan. You need to make sure you are ready and able to vote. The good news is we have expanded models. So October 27th is the deadline to request an absentee ballot from the City Board of Election. All you have to do is go online and type vote.nyc and you will get to the correct location to very easily request an absentee ballot, and also learn information about where you can vote, the hours and the locations for early voting and election day voting. So that brings us to the second way you can vote. Thanks to the legislature, I'm one of them, we passed early voting in New York State, and it's a fabulous model for being able to go vote in person, but over nine days, before the election day. So from Saturday, October 24th through Sunday, November 1st, you can go to an early voting poll site and vote just the way you usually do on election day. You're just gonna face much fewer crowds because as more people spread out over now a 10 day period to vote and counting election day, um, the craziness that sometimes happens in presidential election years doesn't happen to doesn't have to happen here. So early voting, it's new. A lot of people don't understand it, but I'm telling you, it's probably the best and most reliable way to feel that you saw your ballot get accepted and you knew you know you voted. And of course, you still can vote on election day, Tuesday, November third, the way you always have voted in the past. If you have any questions or any concerns or any problems, you can call my office. We're busy answering questions and helping resolve problems for people every day. It is too late to register to vote. You missed that window. So let's get to this afternoon's event. We're so pleased to continue our partnership with the New York Public Library and share useful strategic information about the job search process for older people. Job searches are never easy. And we know that they are much more challenging for older workers. Now add COVID to the mix and even the most optimistic job seeker might wanna give up, don't give up. We are fortunate to have two expert presenters today who will give us guidance 
about how to manage the job search process, including creating an effective resume, mastering the job interview, interview process, and remaining resilient during the process. Wow, we talk about resiliency all the time nowadays. So you have to be resilient to stay strong and stay healthy and follow social distancing and wear a mask. We talk about resiliency in our environmental policies so that New York City doesn't end up underwater in a couple of decades. And now we're talking about resiliency in going through the process of hunting for a job. Our two speakers today are Marzina Ermler, Manager of Career Services at the New York Public Library, and Stephen Davis, who is a career coach at Renaissance Solutions. Mm -hmm. And we've worked with them before and they're really terrific. So I'm so glad that they could be with us today. To get more information about the presentation and the library's employment support programs, you can go to my Senior Resource Fair webpage at www.lizkruger.com slash SRF slash. SRF is Senior Resource Fair. Again, www.lizkruger.com slash SRF slash. After the presentation, I'll come back and moderate a Q&A. And we have questions that were submitted in advance and you can submit questions today on either format, um, Zoom or Facebook. People who are watching on Zoom can submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of their Zoom window. And you, and you can request, you can ask questions just by typing them into your Facebook page. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Marzina and Steve and let them do their presentation. And then we'll all come back for questions along with a legal expert from the Human Rights Commission. So thank you so much, Marlena and Steve. Marzina and Steve, I apologize. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Kruger. I'm just going to uh, start the video and share my screen uh, as I'm doing it. Okay, that should take just a minute. I hope that you guys can see it. Yes, thumbs up? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, I want to call us, Stephen, if you don't mind, dynamic duo. And I wanted to thank Stephen as well for uh, supporting this program because Stephen volunteers for New York Public Library very often and I have uh, asked him to volunteer at this event as well. And Senator Kruger, thank you so much for allowing us to participate in this uh, fantastic uh, initiative. I think uh, taking care of yourself as you are aging is super important. We all will be there. We all are there, uh, there already. Uh, so um, uh, thank you for that, for that uh, ongoing support. Um, and as you said, Senator Kruger, uh, looking for a job at any age is difficult, but um, uh, especially now, it is even more difficult because of so many people who have lost jobs and, uh, and all the issues that we have to deal with. Um, but as you also said, we cannot give up because hiring is happening. And I know this from firsthand, from Stephen, who is hiring people all the time uh, and helping people to get jobs. So what, what we will uh, do today uh, is to look at these four aspects of uh, job search for mature job seekers, as we want to call them, people 55 plus, 50 plus. Um, and uh, the job search as a subject is obviously very extensive. Um, so we will not be able to go very deep in these uh, uh, topics we will signal the most important aspects that you have to keep in mind. And we will also give you tools where to find more information and where to find more support. Uh, okay, so um, I will start with the first idea. And this is also something that Senator Kruger mentioned at the beginning, that we need to take care of ourselves first. 
Uh, and this is all about being resilient, right? Ha creating resilient mindset. Um, so when, when we are thinking about job search, we very often concentrate on, as I would call it, technical aspects of job search, meaning I need to have a really good resume. I really need to have a really well-designed LinkedIn profile, prepare for job interviews. So these are these technical aspects that are super, super important. And we will talk about them as well. But uh, what is even more important is us, right? The human being who is in the midst of job search. So some of these things that, um, and there are many, uh, that support your uh, self-care and creation creation of that resilient mindset is, um, as you can see here on the slide, connection with good family and friends. And I emphasize the word good uh, because many people very often in our uh, immediate circles have very good uh, intentions, but sometimes they are not helpful. They might be nagging. They might be like, you know, not giving us the energy uh, that we need, right, for job search and for ourselves. And instead, they are, as I call them, energy vampires. So just remove yourself from those people as much as you can, so you can really preserve that mental uh, resilience and energy for job search. And you can get support in building that resilience through uh, resilience coaching that we have added to the free uh, coaching that New York Public Library offers. We have added this service right at the beginning of the pandemic in April because we have recognized that besides those technical skills in job search, resilience is going to be even more important than before. So you can sign up and work with a resilience coach to uh, help you to build that resilience mindset, resilient mindset and help you plan, right? Because again, uh, that's also one of uh, those super important steps, uh, having a good plan. Um, the next uh, couple of bullets that I wanted to emphasize is having patience. And that's not easy uh, task, many of us, uh, and. I'm guilty as charged. We would like to do things right away, fast, and get the results fast. Uh, but we have to create that patient mindset as well as resilience mindset because things will take a little bit more time. Uh, job process will also take more, more time. Job search process will take more time. So be patient with yourself. Be patient with people around you and keep positive. Um, and there are, again, many different ways to, to do that. We have, uh, and I will talk about this later uh, uh, more, we have at the library free uh, webinars that uh, help you also with gaining tools to keep that positivity going. And I'm not talking about sort of like a Pollyanna positivity. I'm talking about tools that work for you. Right? But what works for me to keep myself upbeat and energized and positive might not work for you. So you can choose from various, various tools. Um, one of the things that I feel it's super important, and that's why uh, I created the bullet for it, is the idea of uh, quality sleep. Right? If we don't sleep, our body feels that we are under... Um, siege, right, under immunological siege. And we know how important our immunity uh, is, especially right now. Um, sleep is important, but also physical activity is also important. So uh, because we are more than before spending time in front of screens, uh, being pixelated over kilometers and miles and around the globe, sometimes we sit too much, right? We they uh, sitted, sitted uh, for too longer time. So uh, find ways of being active. Some of my friends uh, designed for themselves a silly dance hours. So they, they just put some type of music on that makes them happy and just silly dance, right? In their kitchen or in their living room. Uh, the next uh, idea on this slide is the one, three, five, 
to-do list. And that 135 to-do list helps with building a momentum forward and combating procrastination. So sometimes we feel kind of in the rut, right? We almost, you know, I, I when I coach my clients, people sometimes say, you know what, I'm just frozen. I cannot move forward. I don't know what to do. It just, I don't have energy to do anything. So the simple idea of one, three, five to-do list can be a very useful tool for you to move forward. Uh, how it works is also very simple. Uh, before you go to bed, but before you get super tired, you have to grab a piece of paper. I actually have a specific, a, a spe special notebook designated for that. And in this notebook, write down one big goal that you want to accomplish tomorrow, three medium-sized goals that you want to accomplish tomorrow, and five little goals that you want to accomplish tomorrow. And why you want to do this is because when you wake up the next morning, you are not thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do today? And then you start designing that, that day for, for uh, that actions for that day. When you wake up with your goals sketched out, you can be already in action. You don't have to think and use your mental energy on thinking, what am I going to do today? So that one, three, five to do list can help you with moving forward and stopping procrastination. And the last bullet on this slide that I wanted to emphasize is being kind and professional. Uh, our um, environment is so complicated right now. There is so many stressors. It's very easy to lose our best selves and, uh, and have maybe not the best foot forward. So just when you, when you think about being kind to yourself, extend this kindness to everybody that you are in touch with, that you are communicating with. And that is, uh, you know, bundled together with being professional. So when you are in job search, when you're interacting with people uh, in Zoom meetings, in interviews, in uh, uh, phone communications, email communications, always sort of err on the side of being gentle, being professional, being kind, uh, and, uh, and that will bring you more results than being forceful and um, yeah, than being forceful. Uh, the, the last three bullets I actually have taken from, or actually idea, I have taken from an article that I read a few days ago and I thought it was fantastic. Uh, it's from New York Times uh, and it's about preparing yourself emotionally for colder weather. And I will share this article with you uh, or the organizers will share this article with you. But um, what what really struck me as interesting in this article was the research that has been done through many different um, research institutions from Harvard to Princeton, um, where the psychologist helped us to figure out how to move forward, especially when, um, you know, seasons are changing, our, um, we can be preoccupied by so many different things and we can be stressed out. So uh, first idea that they have shared is to acknowledge the fact that you can, you might be stressed out, that you might be angry, that you might have lack of energy. Just feel the feeling, allow this feeling to surface and experience it. Because if you allow it to experience it, it's also going to pass at some point, right? Hopefully sooner than later. So you don't wanna wallow in that emotion, negative emotion. You want to move out of it and you can move out of it by finding alternatives, right? So we'll be talking about networking. In the past, you could have met with someone at the coffee shop and have a 20 minute networking uh, uh, conversation. Now it's a little bit difficult. Uh, but what are the alternatives, right? So we'll talk about those alternatives. Um, maybe before you could uh, be active, right, physically. Now you have to find a different outside, right? You could go to a gym, uh, et cetera. Now you have to find a different alternative. Maybe that's silly dance, right, that you would do in your living room. 
and then making a plan, right? So how do I move forward? So I'm, I don't feel stuck in a rut. Uh, and for that, again, I would recommend making appointments with our career coaches, making appointments with our resilience coaches. Okay, so I know there is a lot. Uh, Stephen, any reactions to that? Anything that I didn't cover? You covered all, all I'd really like to share is that um, as a recruiter for 22 years, I have come to understand that the most valuable thing that a job seeker has is their state of mind. So um, Marjan, I think you covered all of that. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so speaking of planning, right? So we want to uh, we want to introduce to you the idea of the job search process for um, a mature job seeker. Again, you have the advantage because you had had jobs, you had had uh, projects that you have uh, led in the past. So with that advantage, put your project management hat and create for yourself and job search plan. And one of those uh, one of those challenges when we don't have a job is that you know the, the passage of time can be either very slow or very fast. Uh, we don't have that structure that was given to us before by nine to five job and the responsibilities that we had in this job. So now we have to create that structure for ourselves. And one of the things that I would like to re recommend is to have a job log. You can Google job log, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is all kinds of examples um, on the net. You can just you know, grab one and use it, or you can create your, your own uh, 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 job log. What this job log should track is the important thing. So uh, the job log should help you to track the people that you are talking to, uh, the people that you are reaching out as a new potential networking opportunities, people that you are reaching out to uh, apply for jobs, uh, companies, company addresses, uh, um, email addresses of people that you have uh, interacted with at those companies. Anything that is job search related, you should put in that job log um, and I would also add some type of uh, time frame to it, right? So maybe you search uh, company information for 30 minutes or an hour on a specific date. Log this in because you want to also reflect, right? You want to reflect on all these activities and also that 135 to-do list can be a great solution for you uh, because um, it will help you to, again, be in the, um, in the process of, of uh, uh, being planful. Uh, so setting timelines is important because you wanna, uh, like I said, reflect and uh, find out, um, am I getting results from my actions? If I'm not getting results after a few weeks, um, then what should I change, right? So what, what changes should I uh, add to my strategies to get, uh, to get some type of traction and to move forward. Uh, so when we prepared this presentation, I want to also give a shout out to Teresa San Roman, who was also uh, one of the people that I started this presentation with from a wonderful uh, organization called Maturity Works. And I will be talking about this organization later on. Um, Steven, uh, when we prepared this slide, we were talking about networking. So can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, this idea of networking for a mature job seekers? Sure. Um, most people think that networking means reaching out to all your contacts and everybody that you know and asking them to help you. Uh, that is not the most effective way to do networking. And um, based on what Marjana had just shared with everyone, I mean, one of the most popular services that I provide at the library and also uh, as a leadership coach and a career coach is job search strategy and networking is a large part of that. And it's really important for people to understand that we are all products, you know, companies hire individuals or organizations hire individuals 
who fulfill a job need, just like Senator Kruger would hire someone who she believes would fulfill a need that she and her colleagues have to, to execute on, on their jobs. So uh, it's an interesting statistic that LinkedIn, if you do a Google search on your name, 80% of the time you'll get your LinkedIn profile, which means that anyone else that runs a Google search with your name will get your LinkedIn profile. That is perception and perception is reality. So before you get into networking, I would encourage everyone to make sure that you have a strong brand and a strong image on LinkedIn. It is the number one resource where recruiters search for candidates to fill jobs. And it's important to have a strong photograph, a smile, make sure you're not holding a margarita, make sure you're not wearing a wedding gown with a very heavy necklace and make it professional. And as far as networking, there are two ways to network. You can reach out to your contacts, your friends, your acquaintances, your former colleagues. And what's most effective is reaching out to complete strangers. And if you follow the suggestions that Marjana is sharing as far as logging your search activities, I would strongly recommend creating an Excel spreadsheet and documenting the names of companies you want to work for and do a LinkedIn search and find people in those companies who are either recruiters or potential hiring managers for skill sets that you have and start networking with a complete stranger. And there are methods to this madness as far as what message can you send a stranger who is most likely working from home, uh, dealing with distractions like everyone is, family, friends, children, background noises, uh, potentially a spouse who's working from home, uh, doing Zoom calls, phone calls, uh, you know, school with children. So the message must be very targeted, respectful, and action-oriented. If you can do that, you would be surprised how many people would want to follow up with you as long as they don't think you're trying to sell them something or if they don't think you want something from them. Because the only thing you should really ask them for is their advice and admiring how much their career has grown because of the information you read about them and try to take that to a phone call. Now, one of my largest clients is JP Morgan. I can't tell you how many people send messaging and requests to connect because I work with JP Morgan. I used to accept all of them until they wanted me to send their resumes to the HR managers. Now, no one in their right mind would send a resume to someone they don't know because it's a reflection on you and your reputation. So I caution you to do a little research come up with a three sentence or a four sentence message on LinkedIn and document who you're messaging, document the names as Marjana mentioned in your daily calendar of activities to keep focus with that 135 list. And as you grow, you're gonna build momentum. And the, in my experience, the odds are, this is a numbers game. And if you reach out to 10 complete strangers with a powerful connection message, you might get one or two that will accept you. If you do it 20 times, two or three. If you do it 30 times, three or four. Well, guess what? You just need one. And most people might think, oh, I can't do that. I don't know. What are they going to think of me? Well, no offense, but they probably won't remember you in a week. So... As Marjana said, if you're not working, adjust it every month. I would even consider adjusting it every couple of weeks. But uh, your LinkedIn is the gateway to receiving next steps in your job search. Yes, and then uh, thank you so much. Uh, LinkedIn is super important. I wanted to also uh, recommend meeting with people via meetups, via Zoom meetings. And sometimes we want to you know, connect only with people professionally, 
uh, but you want to also connect with people, period, right? So maybe you will be participating in meetup that uh, talks about, I don't know, um, the best coffee in the world or something like that. And through these connections, then you start talking to people and creating relationships um, online, right? And creating connections like that. Um, another option, then, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but there's another option as well uh, on LinkedIn because LinkedIn has groups. So if you're um, in advertising, advertising has many, many groups, marketing, many, many groups. Uh, administration, operations, they all have groups on LinkedIn. If you join, you'll see some very interesting comments made and you can look up the names of the people that are making those comments. And since you're members of the same group, you have something in common. And that's one of the most effective ways to generate a response from a stranger is having something in common. Sorry to interrupt, Marjana. No, exactly. So having something in common, love for an industry, love for some type of hobby, right? And, and this is where also the patience comes in. Because like Stephen said, don't expect that you will just say, oh, you know what, you work in this company, I'm applying for this job. Uh, by the way, my name is John Smith. Could you forward my resume to the hiring manager? It, nobody will do that. So you have to be patient and create those relationships over time. So uh, right now, when you are not working, might be the perfect time to really build that portfolio of connections, portfolio of relationships. And one thing I wanted to say, there's so much stuff we could talk about when it comes to networking, but sometimes, very, very often actually, in coaching situations, people are asking me, and I'm sure Stephen, you've heard this also, oh, I haven't talked to this person for the last five years, last 10 years, how can I, I mean, I feel so bad, you know, can I reach out to them? Yes, yes, reach out to them. It's fine. You know, they have not reached out to you too for the last five years or 10 years. So you are in, on, the, on the equal footing here. Just reach out, ask how they are and just, you know, tell them, that, you know what, I'm re, uh, reconnecting with people that mattered to me in the past and you are on top of my list. How are you, right? Now, using a very human approach will help you to kind of re reheat uh, your network. Okay. And also, it's important to document those names as well, Marjana. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And one last thought, if you're not working, looking for a job is a full-time job. So every morning when you wake up, if you're looking for a job, have a list, as Marjana is talking about, have a job search strategy, a to-do list, just like you would have if you were on the job. Okay, uh, I'm just mindful of our time. So I wanted to move to the next very important tool that we have in job search, which is the resume, right? So Stephen, can you maybe start us on, on this? Sure. Um, the only purpose of a resume is to secure an interview. And the best advice I can share as a recruiter uh, is to, number one, understand the world of a recruiter, because the recruiter is the gatekeeper between you and a hiring manager. And the second gatekeeper is an ATS, which is an acronym for an applicant tracking system. And they exist because recruiters don't have the time to read every application and every resume. So the challenge is to make it through the ATS scan. And if you do, and timing is on your side and a recruiter has, is still looking for qualified candidates and reads your resume, if they're not motivated to request an interview by the time they read about 60% of page one, they're clicking off you, you post and they're looking at another resume that made it through the applicant tracking system. So the resume length, one page or not. Typically, anyone with that's a recent college graduate with three or four years of experience should have one page. Uh, anyone with five to 10 or more years should have a page and a half to two pages. A resume should not be any longer than two pages unless someone is in education, is going for uh, a healthcare position, is going for uh, a government position. 
then there's all kinds of uh, details that need to be added, but it, it really shouldn't be longer than three or four pages. But for the average employable uh, industrial type technology professional, whether you're in advertising or marketing or media, whatever, uh, two pages is the way it really should be, or one and a half to two. Um, so many people that I work with are so proud of courses they've taken, of their hobbies, of uh, places that they've traveled to, of, of accomplishments that they're proud of in their previous positions. Well, guess what? If those words are not in the job description, it will not help to get an interview. The, please approach the resume and the cover letter as well as a tool to speak to someone. And in order to be successful in getting to that conversation, the resume must have a high score in an ATS, match a substantial number of skill sets. And just to be more specific, as you probably know, everyone that's looking for a job, job descriptions are fairly common in their uh, context and their layout. There's usually a description of what the company does, then the responsibilities, the job title, then there's a section called requirements or the, as we call it in hiring, the, re, the required skills, the must have skills. If you don't have 70% or more of those skills, as badly as you want that job, looking for a job is not about what you would like to do. It's not about what your passion is. Again, this is technology. If you would like it, if you're passionate about it, please be sure that you have at least seven out of 10 of those required skills, education, and experience, and then modify your resume to match those words. The cover letter has one purpose. That's to, you're gonna load it up with the keywords in the job description as well, but that's the place where you can use first person. Resume, you don't wanna use I am, it's just not appropriate. Your LinkedIn profile in your about section is very appropriate. Your cover letter, very appropriate. After reading this exciting opportunity, I believe that I have almost all the required skills, knowledge, and experience. And then make a business case because when a human being reads that cover letter, they're trying to identify how you communicate and what your personality is like. And finally, if you do match most of the requirements as you indicate, so giving examples, list the top three or four requirements and mention, you know, as noted, you're looking for someone who, who knows Oracle and Microsoft Excel. And, you know, if you're in accounting and finance, or if you're in technology, mention the skills that are required in your cover letter, because the purpose of it is to motivate the reader to look at your resume. Education dates, ageism exists. We all know it. We all deal with it. Uh, there's no reason to you know, indicate your age. We as recruiters will try to figure it out anyway. Uh, it depends on how far back you go. So I wouldn't recommend uh, putting your, your graduation dates. Uh, it's not necessary. And uh, I would not recommend going back any more than 15, at the most, 20 years of employment experience. No more than 20 years, assuming that most of those years are aligning with the job you're applying to. If your early career, you did a career change like many of us have done, including myself, if it's not rele relevant to the job description you're applying to, it's not going to help you. Looking for a job is not about you. It's about your ability to convince decision makers that you have the skills and the requirements they need. So, that's the typical journey of the resume. Oh, great. One thing I would want to add is the technology skills. Yes. Um, because that is sometimes the kind of myth that is surrounding um, mature job seekers that people who are of certain age, 50 plus, are not technologically advanced. Right. So you right. have to combat that perception by making sure that you have the right skills. So now if you are in job search, could be the perfect time to get all the certifications, the, the, the basic certifications, for example, in Microsoft Office products, 
uh, think about the industry that you are interested in. See if there is anything, any type of technologies, any type of uh, certifications that are important for that industry. And if you can, get them, right? Especially the, the basic Microsoft Office technologies um, have free certifications. You can get them through lynda.com, which you can access free through the New York Public Library website, um, just to make sure that uh, those technologies are present on your resume, because that is one of the question marks that hiring managers have. Will Absolutely. this person, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Will this person no, thank be you. Uh, needing training? Everyone needs to know Microsoft Office products, no matter what job you're going for. And by the way, Linda is L-Y-N-D-A dot com. If you can find it on the library website, it is absolutely free. All you really need to do is enter your library card number and you're in. And uh, just for everyone's uh, knowledge, I'm sure a lot of people won't be happy about this, but uh, the most marketable and higher up hiring skills that are being uh, actively pursued these days is technology. So right. lynda.com, if you want to learn how to write code, I don't care what your age is. If you can write code and you can say I'm certified in Python or Java or C++ and it's free to you and you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to work for NASA, but if you know how to write a code, you can get a job doing that. And that is a sustainable occupation. Right, so now it could be that. Sorry, time. sorry. Really, last thing I wanna share, this is really important. When you do know Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, please don't just put Microsoft Office on your resume because you won't match the words in the job description. If the job description needs Microsoft Word, use Microsoft Word. That's it, sorry. No, 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 that's uh, super important. So you, you were talking about ATS, right? The applicant tracking system, which is an algorithm matching words on your resume with the words of the job description. And right. if the job description has Microsoft Excel on it and you put Microsoft Office on it, the human reader will understand, yeah, it's the same thing. You know, Microsoft Office has Excel in it, but the computer system, the algorithm will not make that match. They're not that smart yet. Uh, for good or for bad. Um, so anyhow, here on this slide, we have uh, a resume um, and it's not a perfect resume. We just wanted to kind of emphasize different, uh, um, uh, different, let's say, fields of a resume, right? So uh, this is a, a resume that is very often called hybrid resume. So it has the beginning right, uh, right here. You see uh, this kind of grabber, as I call it. So you have a statement uh, that should include those juicy keywords that you will find in the job posting. Uh, the next, uh, the next is also, uh, the next portion is also loaded with keywords, right? So they will be, again, specific to the job that you are uh, applying for, because you want to make sure that the ATS gets super excited when it sees your resume. And then the human that is going to be looking at your resume is going to be also looking from the top down. And if they see, oh my gosh, this person has all the skills that we are looking for, they will more um, likely to keep reading your resume and spend more time on you, right? And this is what we are going for. So this resume we, um, I found on the Muse, which is one of really good um, job sites that you should know about. They have a very well descri de described um, information. They have a great uh, websites that they share with different techniques. And by the way, Steven is one of the Muse coaches as well. Uh, yeah, and Marjana, can I just share something? I think it's a, it's very relevant to what you're talking about. Uh, I coach so many people who send me their resume that they put together on Microsoft Word, and um, if if you use a template on Microsoft Word to write your resume, I caution you to be extremely careful not to have tables in your resume in your Word document because most people don't know this, 
applicant tracking systems cannot read data within tables. They're not programmed that way. As of about a year ago, they just started to have applicant tracking systems reading data and PDF. So that is not a problem in most cases. However, please don't use a table in your resume because it, your, your words will not be scanned by the system. Excellent point. So if possible, uh, again, this will, you will be guided by the requirements of the a website that you are applying through, the applicant tracking system website. If possible, as Stephen said, uh, save your resume in PDF if that's, if that's one of the form, formats that is allowed. Uh, if not, well, send it uh, in whatever format they're looking for. So maybe it is Word. Uh, but it's not ideal for all these reasons that Stephen have, uh, has mentioned. But also, Word is also not sort of frozen uh, in time, which means that the way you look at your resume might be completely different uh, um, way that, uh, let's say, someone uh, on a different computer will be, will be uh, viewing it, right? So the fonts might be different, et cetera. So the layout you, might be different too, yeah. Right, exactly. And... Um, uh, and there, again, there's so much stuff that we could share about the resumes. And I know as we're telling you these um, uh, little nuggets of information, you probably have all kinds of questions. So don't despair, make an appointment with one of our career coaches. Uh, I'm sure the, um, uh, the support um, staff uh, on this webinar has already shared some of the links that we have prepared and there are links to make an appointment with one of our career coaches uh, that can help you to format your resume so it passes through the uh, robots, the applicant tracking system, and then it passes also through the human, right, who will be uh, reading it. Anything else uh, that comes to your mind regarding this slide? That's all I have. Okay, great. All right, so this is a very quick, uh, again, kind of re-emphasis that it is important how you format your resume. This, uh, this shows you uh, a research that has been done. Uh, so uh, recruiters were equipped with special glasses that were measuring how much time their eyes rest on particular aspects of a resume or a particular portion of a resume. So on this side, as you can see, all those yellow and orange blobs indicate that the recruiter's eyes were resting and spending more time on a particular uh, portion of the resume. So here on the top, uh, you can see that the person was look, looking at the grabber, right? That's uh, that positioning statement, maybe the keywords that the person has included there. Here you can see that they're looking at the most recent role that the person had. And here you're looking at the other uh, or the second role that the person uh, mentioned. And at the end, they are spending some time on education and maybe some additional keywords that the person has added. On the opposite side, you have a different resume and you also see that the person was looking at the top of the resume. Maybe that was the first role that the person mentioned there. And then they were looking at the second uh, role, but uh, look what happens on the very bottom nobody was looking at it. And why was that happening? Steven, can you tell us why? It's exactly what I mentioned earlier. If you don't motivate a recruiter to email you and request an interview, by the time they get to about 60% of your first page, you're toast. Right. Yeah, that's the reason. So you have to grab the attention of the reader from the very beginning. Uh, and also in addition to this, also take a look how, uh, how much balance of text and white space are on both Sorry. resumes. So if your resume- is crazy. Right. Sorry, if, I'm, so, yeah. Marjana, if I can just interrupt just for one yep. second, I'm a connection problem, so I hope I don't get lost. But I wanted to share this, that recruiters please don't think that a recruiter is going to look for things in your resume. We won't. We won't. Every single recruiter is trained to eliminate candidates, not to find reasons to qualify people. Please, if you don't remember anything from today, 
please remember that. That's why this slide is so important. They're, you know, counting the seconds that they're taking away from finding someone who might be more qualified. So any reason, a small font, uh, a typo, uh, you know, poor English, poor sentence structure, poor anything will give the recruiter, you know, they're looking at potentially 20, 30, 40 or more resumes. They're trained to eliminate, not to stay and look for. Sorry. Well, no, perfect. That, that's exactly it. That's why we wanted to include this uh, slide. So now uh, let's hope that you got past the uh, ATS, you are now invited for an interview. Uh, and in this day and age, in the pandemic time, you really have to look at virtual interviewing, right? So uh, it's going to be happening over the phone, maybe uh, via screening first, but at some point you will be like we are right now on Zoom or maybe Google Meet, maybe any other platform. So it is very, very important that you become familiar with those platforms. Practice with your friends, practice with your family, participate in Zoom meetings like this one. So when the time comes and you have to use that technology to work, to show yourself, right? To kind of showcase who you are during the interview, that you are not worried about the technology, that you are not worried, oh my gosh, is my camera ready? Do I know how to turn it on? Do I know uh, what the lighting is at my table? Maybe it will be, maybe you need to use your bedroom. Make sure that you stage it in a way that it doesn't look like a bedroom. Because again, people will make those Split second uh, decisions about you. Um, they do it in in person interviews and they do it also during the virtual interviews. And in the virtual interviews, that additional technology aspect is very important. So, for a mature job seeker, is super important that you master all of these technologies and you are fluent in it and you are not stumbling through it and not being. Um, hindered by, uh, but by that particular aspect of the interview. So, uh, another issue that you have to participate, uh, that you have to anticipate, is uh, that you know people will be asking those traditional interview questions, right? Like the elevator pitch. Uh, it, so, think about the a virtual interview in the same way as uh, an actual in-person interview. So, practice. The elevator pitch that has to be specific to the job that you are applying for. So it cannot be something that you created once 10 years ago and kind of, you know, reuse it as you could reuse an old resume, which you shouldn't do anyway, as we said. Um, and make sure that this elevator pitch is, uh, is again, specific to the job that you are applying for to make that strong first impression. Can I, yes. Uh, interview is really an art. And when I start, I myself have anywhere from five to sometimes 12 or 14 interviews a week. And the first question I ask is, tell me about yourself. And a lot of HR recruiters will ask, you know, why did you apply? Or why do you think you're qualified? Or, you know, after all your years of experience, why do you think this is the right position for you? It's the same answer. Please don't rehash what's on your resume. No one will schedule an interview with you unless they think you're qualified. And that's based on your resume. So you're qualified. The recruiter wants to understand how you think, how you communicate, and why you feel you are qualified. So um, the elevator pitch, the why, you know, tell me about yourself, why did you apply? It shouldn't be more than 30 or 40 seconds long. And it's an insight into what, you know, how you think and why you started your career where you did. And please remember, it's got to be related to the job you're being considered for. And talk about growth and talk about learning. And if you were promoted over the years, talk about that. And then explain why you're looking if you've been out of work for a while, you know, there, everybody has, many people have, you know, highly legitimate reasons for being out of work. 
if you were uh, reorganized in your company, please don't say you were laid off. Uh, just say the company went through a reorg and a number of people were moved out and you were one of them. You know, perception is reality. So uh, just please tell a story that's going to motivate the recruiter to want to get you to the next step. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And one of the things that I would recommend also is sometimes it's helpful when you are preparing for the interview to write things down. If you know that you will be nervous when someone will ask you, so why, you know, why did you leave the last job? Write, write down your answer. So when that answer comes your way, you can be prepared for it. You will not stumble through it. There will be no hummus. There will be no ums. Uh, you will have a very short and sweet story that uh, explains the reason. Uh, so anything that you are fear fearful of, write it down. Write down what you will say, uh, and that way you will really feel confident and prepared uh, for that interview uh, situation. And then um, the next suggestion is to use uh, PAR, right? PAR is... Um, problem, actions, and results. So in the interview process, uh, you can imagine that you are one of many people that you are being interviewed and they are asked very often the same type of questions and they will be giving the same type of answers very often, right? Because, you know, they are trying to prove the same thing as you are trying to prove, that you are the best candidate for that particular uh, position. Um, so, uh, the idea of using stories in interview process is very powerful because you can differentiate yourself from other candidates. Your story is going to win. You are different than everybody else because you can be very specific in how you are creating the story. And again, uh, uh, creating a good stories for your resumes and also for the interview process is whole another workshop and we have those workshops at the library. You can also practice those stories when you work with uh, your coach individually. Uh, so those stories really reflect what you can do for the company. Uh, think also as a uh, transfer, if you have any transferable skills, right? Because if you are thinking of changing jobs, you already, as a mature job seeker, have very many skills in your portfolio, and now you can repackage them to kind of you know fit a new uh, industry or a new situation. So, so these are and and think also as a again for for a mature job seeker, think about questions that you want to find right. You want to find answers during the interview because it's super important that you learn as much about the company that you are interviewing for as uh, they are learning about you because you want to make sure that this company is really truly really a good fit for you and for uh, mature job seekers and uh, for anybody else we have a book recommendation here smart women's guide to interviewing and salary negotiation and it's not just for women it's for everybody um and you can you can try you, you can try we do have it at the new york public library you can request it through the grab and go service and get your hands uh on it that way i uh i'm not sure if we have steven with us here because we had some connectivity issues in the morning uh if steven isn't here then he can add anything if not uh, we are really at the end of our presentation, um, and now it's the Q&A uh, Q&A time. Uh, we have uh, some additional resources for you. I'm sure they will be shared or have been shared during the presentation. Uh, you can also get in touch with uh, Stephen or me. We have our addresses uh, and the way to contact us on the slide. So that's all what we have for you for today. Thank you so much, Marzina and Steven, which hopefully we will get back when he resolves his technical glitches. Um, but he was here for us for the entire presentation. So that's great. Again, the two phenomenal experts who take very different 
sort of angles for us. Um, so as I said before, we have questions that were sent ahead of time. I'm going to go through them and then hopefully still have a chance to get some of the questions that you all have been writing in um, to your Zoom or your Facebook accounts. Um, some of the questions that we had in advance are legal questions about age-related discrimination during the job search process and on the job. So I'm very pleased that Daryl Cochran, director of the Manhattan Community Service Center at the New York City Commission of Human Rights is able to join us during the Q&A portion of the event. And I see that Daryl's just turned on his um, audio and video. Hey, Daryl, I haven't seen you in quite a few years, I think. <laughs> I hope you're well. Thanks for having us. I'm very glad you're joining us. Everybody just circles around in life and keeps bumping into each other in different positions. <laughs> um, all right, so links about general information on the commission and their new guidance on age-related employment discri discrimination and Daryl Cochran's contact information will be posted in the chat. And some people not, might not know that we recently did a town hall discussion specifically around age discrimination and work and new guidance from the New York City um, Commission on Human Rights, which is a fabulous resource for people of all ages who might not know about it. So just another good opportunity to learn something else about government agencies that are out there working on your behalf and you might not know about. So I'm glad that we're giving people a chance to learn a little bit more about them. And again, one more time for any of the information from my senior resource um, fair or for other resources, my website, www.lizkruger.com slash SRF senior resource fair and click on the job resources tab to get the links to the commission's resources, as well as our other guests today. All right, now jumping directly into questions. So the, the biggest question is, and I'll open it up to anyone, um, how do you overcome ageism when you're job hunting? Okay, so let me let me start, and I would say that uh, some of the contents of the presentation that we went through would be one of the good first steps, and and then I think it for me it's also the question of mindset. It will be super difficult to overcome ageism in someone else's mind, but for me it's more about overcoming ageism in our own minds as mature job seekers. So we shouldn't allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the idea that, oh, I'm a mature job seeker, I'm 55 years old, or I'm 50 years old, or whatever years old, and therefore I cannot get a job. Because if we start from that point of view, everything is going to be more difficult because we first have to fight with our own brain, with our own mind. So clearing all the cobwebs first and saying, yes, I can do it. I have the tools, I have the patience, I have the wisdom. Especially if we think about wisdom, people who are mature have more wisdom, have more emotional intelligence, which is so important in today's work environment than younger uh, professionals, people who are just graduated, who might have, you know, super new skills, but they don't have that uh, emotional intelligence. And I think that is something that we should pay attention to. Thank you. Okay, so, and I think we, we had this discussion before we went online, um, but are there best companies for older New Yorkers to apply to? Is there like a master list of companies that are welcoming in hiring 50 and older, age 50 and older? And is there some way to get a list of either the best companies to work for if you're 50 and older, and also best remote jobs and companies <clears throat> that are hiring seniors? So um, I, have, I have done a lot of research and there is definitely not one big master list of companies that would say, yes, we really want people who are mature or 50 years 
old class, because if you think about this, that would be reverse uh, discrimination also, right? Companies would say, well, you know what? Uh, you are excluding me because I'm younger. But there are companies who specialize in helping people to gain skills who might have uh, left workforce uh, for a variety of reasons and now they are a little bit older. So one of those companies is called irelaunch.com. Uh, they partner with different organizations, um, with different companies from Goldman Sachs to JP Morgan, and uh, through internship programs, bring in people who maybe had a break in their careers because they had to take care of uh, family members, the children, whatever that might have been. And now they have, they have skills from the past and they need, need that additional support in getting back on track. So that's with sort of uh, corporate America. Uh, if someone is trying to kind of re, um, rescale their skills and, um, um, and find part-time jobs, right? That might be helpful to the community and helpful for their well-being as well because active being helpful to others uh, prolongs our energy reservoirs and our longevity. Um, a, a company that you might wanna check out is reserveinc.org. And again, the, this company uh, provides pro predominantly with part-time jobs. So for 10 uh, hours a week, uh, 15 hours a week. And the company that I mentioned before that provides training and internships uh, for mature job seekers is workplace.com, Maturity Works, by partner Teresa San Roman has uh, partnered with me in the past in providing these uh, presentations for you. Uh, so these would be my top uh, three suggestions for targeted uh, uh, companies, but I will just do research on jobs that you want to get, right? Don't think about, oh, are they going to hire me because I'm older or will they not hire me because I'm older? If you are qualified, flaunt all of those qualifications. Flaunt the fact that you are a mature person who has all the fantastic uh, qualities and can lead people, can be also a great follower, right? Because you know how to do that too. Um, and, uh, and kind of, you know, do that research first. And, and again, I would recommend working with our coaches because they can help you to map the types of jobs, the types of companies that you might be interested in. So the, the first step in mapping is to identify about 20, 30 companies that uh, that fit into your qualifications right fit into the types of jobs that you would like to have thank you so now there's a couple of questions to go back to pack and i think are really for daryl on a job interview is it true that the interviewer cannot ask my age yeah they um you know interviewers should not um, ask about, you know, specific age or anything that may hint to it. Uh, you know, I think some of the biggest things are um, when you graduated from college, right, or grad school or high school. Um, so asking those pointed questions, um, that's, that would be a no-no for them. Yeah. And, and I would, if I could just say too, you know, from the beginning, I often tell uh, folks possible complainants, to go with your gut feeling. If you think a question is being asked, you know, sometimes the same words being said, but given the inflection, could it sounds like they're gonna hold it against you or they may not hold it against you. So really go with your gut feeling, come to the Commission on Human Rights. I know the links are in the chat. Um, and what you may not know is you may meet with one of our attorneys and then we look in our system and see that hey, this same company um, has had other similar complaints against it. Um, so that's something you may not know that we would know. Um, so I definitely go with your gut feeling um, if you want to file a complaint. And how about the way they ask you in writing on your app, maybe an application um, that they ask you to fill out or even how they ask you to fill in information on a resume. So for example, if they ask you what year you graduated college, 
that's probably giving a hint that I'm not, you know, nine, you know, I'm not 14 anymore, or I'm not 25 right, yeah. because I graduated college longer than 25 years ago. Um, or even when they ask you the dates of employment on your resume, is that legal for them to ask you that level of detail? That's a good question. I could uh, certainly get back to uh, our law enforcement bureau attorneys, but you know, in general, those questions are not necessary. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, ascertaining whether or not you have a degree, they simply need to ask whether or not you have it. Um, when you acquire that, really uh, should not matter to them. And this ties into another question that actually came up on the Zoom chat about under relevant experience, you need to chronologically list every job or you or can you point to key jobs and remembering what our other speakers said before about you don't want a resume to be 42 pages long. I think the answer is only highlight the jobs that really were relevant to you and what you're applying for now, which also means you don't have to list and in, you know, in high school, which was 50 years ago, I babysat. I don't think that's really particularly relevant at this point in your life or the job you're likely to apply for, unless you're applying to be a babysitter and the last time you, apply, you babysat was 50 years ago. Um, do you disagree, Marla? Mar Mar yes, yeah? I, I agree. I completely agree that um, resume is not a biography. Right, so it's it's not a legal document that you have to list your entire. Not in the U.S. In other countries, uh, resumes have different formats, and some of them require everything from your picture to the date of birth, etc. We are not we are not requiring that in United States. So uh, it should be just the information that is relevant to the job that you are applying for. This is why it's so tricky sometimes because you know you have to get into habit of creating slightly different resumes for the types of jobs that you are applying for to emphasize the things that you are really uh, bringing to the table for that particular company. So very often, uh, what I recommend to the job seekers is to create sort of like the mother resume, put everything that you have done that you remember, all those accomplishments, the stories, and then. When you are applying for a particular job, just create a job, create the resume just for that one job, editing, right? Editing, editing, heavily editing the, the, the mother resume and leaving only the things that are relevant. One of the very interesting, sort of very neat uh, techniques uh, to emphasize that you have other skills. So let's say if you decide that you are just giving the information on last 10 years of your employment, and obviously, you know, you might be a mature job seeker. You and something from, let's say, 20 years ago is still relevant because you work for a good brand or you use a particular skill. You can add to your resume after your chronological list of companies one statement that says additional relevant employment. And in that additional relevant employment, you can list, let's say, two or three bullets that will uh, illustrate something that is relevant, that it's not necessarily in that time frame of 10 or 15 last years. And again, I would emphasize that these are great questions uh, that can be helped and answered in greater detail that we are able to um, in the webinar when uh, people make appointments individual with uh, our coaches, which is again, free service. Thank you. If I, if I could just add to, I know you mentioned some of these forms that really go back and ask specifically about um, all of your work history. Um, unfortunately, we know in the past, we've seen many of those forms that asked about credit history, salary history, um, your criminal background. I know we're talking about age discrimination mostly, but uh, just to let people know that those are um, un unlawful areas of discrimination as well. And that should be reported to the commission. Thank you. Yeah, I think, thank you for emphasizing the salary, uh, especially because I think um, this is still very new for people and people uh, do get sometimes asked, right? So what was your most recent salary? And that's not something that uh, you can be asked. Um, people still ask, might ask you, 
what salary do you require, right? And, and you should be prepared for this question. And again, you, the way to prepare for it is really to do a research on the types of the type of job that you are applying for. There is all kinds of websites, including LinkedIn, salary.com, Glassdoor, um, occupation outlook uh, catalog handbook uh, will give that information so you understand the fair market value of the job that you are applying for thank you so here's a specific question but it's a storyline i've heard quite frequently and i think covid sort of is an added punchline for the current storyline which is age discrimination so here we go on March 30th, many of us were let go from our jobs. Most of the people who were let go in my company were above the age of 54. Our boss kept all of the freelancers. Now we have learned that she hired all the freelancers to be full-time employees, and they were all significantly younger than the people laid off. Instead of hiring the older employees back, she hired the younger people. I had worked for this company for eight years. Can I file any kind of discrimination um, um, based on the facts of this case? Yeah, um, I would say a few things about that. Um, you know, first of all, we do see age discrimination cases as early as 40 years old, just FYI. And then, you know, as it relates to that specific one, um, our agency, you could, you know, file a formal complaint, the statute of limitations for age discrimination, as most uh, other protected classes, except for gender, is one year. So you have 12 months to file a complaint. Um, but we also have the ability, if you want to just give us an anonymous tip, our agency has the ability to what's known as testing um, a company. So we could either uh, try to mimic various circumstances to get a job, uh, an interview, and have people that maybe look a different way, have different racial uh, characteristics, or have different age characteristics, um, and see how those people um, are treated um, in each case. And then we can determine for ourselves if uh, discrimination uh, might be happening. Um, also, sometimes we just simply go into a company to look at the demographics of their employees to see if something, you know, seems to be a little off there. Um, so, you know, those, those are some of the remedies that, that we can find at the commission. And then the last really legal question for Daryl, and it's not age specific, is if someone's fired from their job because they refuse to work under what they felt were unsafe conditions given COVID-19, do they have legal recourse? So it certainly could be people who were in higher risk categories who feel more likely that they needed not to return to an office setting or whatever the job setting was. But is there something explicit that stops them from being fired because of the COVID situation? Sure. Uh, you know, as it relates to COVID, that does fall under the disability provision of the human rights law. Um, and within that provision, there's what's known as a reasonable accommodation clause. Um, so through that, you can ask your employer for a reasonable accommodation. Um, what we hope um, will first happen is that uh, encourages what we, we call cooperative dialogue amongst the parties. And if that dialogue somehow breaks down and accommodations aren't being made, um, then that is something that then someone can come to the commission um, and file a complaint. But uh, because it, it is considered a disability, um, you know, people can ask for an accommodation. Uh, sometimes, depending on the nature of the job, people actually, you know, have to be uh, in that office or in that factory, whatever it may be, um, but um, sometimes they, they don't have to and, and other accommodations can be made. So creative thinking and dialogue is, is very helpful in, in that area. And, and I would just also add, as it relates to COVID, um, we do know that some people, uh, much like the recession back uh, 11, 12 years ago, um, are being, are unemployed for long periods of time. Um, and obviously you should have, um, you know, some sort of uh, 
uh, understanding of you know why that is in your resume and be able to convey that. Um, but unemployment status is actually also a protected class within the human rights law. So that if people are unemployed for long periods of time, we know employers may hold that against them, um, but that is also unlawful under the human rights law. More legal questions are coming in, Daryl. So I'm, you're not off the hook yet. And that's fine. I'm okay. So what do you do if you're, if you're being interviewed and the person interviewing you says, I want your financial service, your banking, your insurance company information to sign off so I can keep track of your credit, salary, criminal checks as you move up the interview chain. So it implies you're not going anywhere up the interview chain if you don't sign off and let them have that information. But in New York City, at least, we have certain rules that they can ask you things like, you know, your past salary, and I think your criminal history during an interview. So what do you do when faced with that situation? You sort of know you're writing off your chances mm -hmm. of moving up the ladder of interviews, but mm -hmm. you're also potentially walking yourself into exactly a situation, which is why we changed the laws in New York to try to protect you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and just to be clear, a lot of what was mentioned is unlawful to ask about in, in any sort of interview um, situation. Um, and these laws are new, you know, and some are, I think the, um, the Fair Chance Act is uh, hitting its four year anniversary next week. Um, so, uh, so some of these have only been around four years, three years, I think salary history is about two and a half years old. Um, but that's no excuse. Pe employers should know that it's unlawful to ask about salary history, criminal background, credit history. There are some differences uh, in each of those laws. Uh, for instance, um, at no point can someone inquire about your credit history, either on, uh, you know, on the job posting, uh, during the interview process, or after they make a conditional offer. However, when it comes to arrest and conviction record, they could um, inquire about your criminal background after a conditional offer has been made. It's also important to note that there are certain exemptions when it comes to uh, these provisions of the law. Uh, for instance, we know uh, with credit history, uh, some, of the, you know, some of the exemptions might be in the financial services industry, or if someone uh, will have maybe be a CFO or COO of a company um, and can uh, manipulate uh, data to uh, benefit them financially. Um, and also when it comes to criminal background, there are some exemptions when it comes to jobs that care for the disabled, uh, elderly, individuals, um, uh, children, et cetera. So there are some exemptions to those, but by and large, um, it is unlawful to ask those questions um, at any point, or at least until a conditional uh, job offer has been made. And just because they're going to be asking that at the end, doesn't mean they, they should not be telling you that at the beginning, because then that would, you might self disqualify yourself. Right. And we don't want that to happen. Right. Thank you. So the next, the next sort of group really is for Marzina, I think, or Steve, if he can get back on. So let's say you really think they're going to hit you with, you're overqualified. Why would I want to hire you? So this can be people who, they did leave work at a very top level position. They may have, again, we're not talking about being laid off. We're talking about there being a change in how the company was operating, but you're not applying to be the same top level position you might have left. Um, you're applying for something with, with lower job responsibilities and probably lower salary. Um, you don't necessarily want to come out and say, I'm willing to be paid less because you think that might be cutting off your own nose, but you want to be clear that, you know, they shouldn't imagine if they don't have a CEO job opening, that that's the only kind of job you're looking for. Or in fact, you might have a really clear reason why you want to have a job with less responsibility than the jobs you had in the past. How do you talk about that in the context of a job interview? Because I think that must apply to a lot of the people who are listening today. Yeah, so I think a good uh, first step and approach would be to 
come to this question from the position of curiosity and just ask, so why do you think I'm overqualified? Could you just uh, explain it to me? Uh, because you want to you wanna hear their thoughts, right? Because like overqualified is like, on a, uh, it's a big word. It can cover so many different things. So you want to first get into the, let's say meat and potatoes of this overqualification. Over what do they mean by that? And then when they start talking about it, this is the time for you to counter propose and say, oh, because uh, you, know, you manage people and this position doesn't have any management responsibilities. Uh, counter proposition could be, well, you know, because I was a, a great manager, I'm also a great follower. And I'll be happy to support the team and I'll be happy to support the manager because I understand how important it is for the unity of the team, for the strength of the projects to have great leaders and great followers. So kind of you know, turning the situation around and asking them what they mean uh, very often just you know, opens up the discussion and really showcases what you can do for the company in a completely different way. Thank you. Well, we have actually run out of time. It's amazing how quickly it goes. Um, I do want to highlight there's a quite a bit of information that's been put up on the chat site of contacts and other ways to get follow up information um, and, and follow up help, including to um, actually apply for job counseling through the library. Um, and how to access the Human Rights Commission. Um, so I want to thank so much Marzina, Stephen, who still can't get back on, I'm sorry, and Daryl for joining us today. I think everybody listening learned quite a bit. Um, I also want to remind people this is officially the end of this year's three-part virtual senior resource fair, but remind people that we will be starting up our seniors and boomers breakfast series which we used to do in real life with real breakfast and i think this year we will also be doing virtually so you have to bring your own bagel and coffee um, and that will be a whole series of issues that we hope will be helpful and relevant for older new yorkers and what we call boomers people who are often not only on their way to being older New Yorkers, but often taking responsibility and care for parents in some way. So it's helpful information earlier than when you yourself might need programs and services. So if you're on any kind of email list of mine or mailing list of mine, or we found you for these programs, we will find you to give you the dates and times and schedule for our next set of programs. And of course, we also have been doing virtual town halls Wednesday and Thursday evenings on a whole range of topics that are really driven by, if we get enough people reaching out saying, I need information on this, it dawns on us, oh, there's a lot of people who need to know that. We could try to set up a town hall with some experts and get them information. So my office is trying to be very aggressive about how we translate as much information as we can into user friendly formats and these zoom models of entering people's living rooms and spare bedrooms and dining rooms um, over their computer screens is actually a very effective way to reach large number of people. Um, we joke ourselves that the commute's very easy. You know, it's just on that same desk you're working at probably too many hours per day already. Um, so we will continue to try to communicate with you all um, through these models of Zoom meetings. And again, thank you everybody for participating. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you.